First thing that we are going to add are conditional statements. And these are simple. Remember that a conditional takes the following form. We have if followed by some condition, and then we have a conditional block of code to execute. There's also the option to include an alternate block that we will execute given that the condition is false. And in order to add support for this activity, add the following cases to the top level eval function. The statement block case is easy as it just calls the evaluate statements method that we have already created. The if expression case calls a helper method called evaluate if expression where we pass in the node. Let's go ahead and write that helper method. We'll take an if expression node as a parameter and return an object type. And the first thing to do is actually evaluate the condition expression that lives inside of this node. Then we will call a helper method is truthy, and the is truthy helper method is very simple. We pass in an object, and if the object is null or false, then we return false. Otherwise, we return true. And at this point, you can check it out in the console and verify that the if expressions are working as expected. Next, let's really break out of calculator land and write the logic for our return statements. Essentially, a return statement just says, stop evaluating and return what I have. Whenever we see a return in our language, we're just going to wrap the value that we have currently calculated inside of an object and keep a reference to it as we evaluate. Let's go ahead and create the wrapper object inside of our object package. Create an object type called return obj and then create the return object struct. It will contain a value field that is of type object. Then override the parent method. The inspect method just calls the inspect method on the value object. And to account for these return objects while we are evaluating, we just need to add another case to our top level eval function. The first thing that we do is we evaluate the value inside of our AST return node. Then we just return the result of that inside of our new return object. We will also need to adjust the body of our evaluate statements helper method. Inside, we do a quick check to see what type of statement we have. If it's a return statement, then we just return the value inside of that statement. Make note that we are not returning a return object, but instead the object that it wraps. And this totally works for non-nested structures. But the second we have something like this, it gets all gummed up. We can't try to unwrap it at this deepest level and instead have to be able to pass it all the way up to the top spot. To fix this, we have to change our evaluate statements method. First, we are just going to rename it to be evaluate program. Then we will add an evaluate statement block method to help us untangle the nested blocks. Go back to the switch case for the program node in the eval function and change the body to call this new evaluate program method. In the new evaluate statement block method, copy the body from the evaluate program method, but instead of returning the wrapped object, we are just going to return the whole return object itself. In our top level eval method, change the body of the statement block case to call this new helper method. And with that, our return statements are fully functional. Now let's do something that isn't sexy or fun, but damn it, it's necessary in a language. Let's add error handling to our parser. And these aren't user-defined exceptions. This is when a stupid user has written something wrong, like using the wrong operator, unsupported operations, what have you. And this really is handled a lot like return statements. At the end of the day, errors short circuit the evaluation of a block of code. And like the humble return statement, our error handling requires us to write an error object inside of our object package. Add the error object type next to its friends, and then create a struct that just has one field, a message string to tell the stupid code monkey what they have done wrong. And if we were better at our job, we would add a stack trace and a line number to help them track it down. But I'll leave these exercises to you. Next up, let's write a nice little method in our evaluator that will return an error object it will take a format string as the first parameter and a variadic parameter as the second. That just means that we can pass as many variables as we want. Then we're just going to return an error object with a nice string formatted to our specifications. Now go back to every place in our evaluator where we are returning null and replace that with this new method. It will take a minute, please don't hate me. And I encourage you to write your own error message, use that nifty chat TPG I'm always hearing so much about, or just look at the source code listed in the description for the error strings that I am using. And now that we are returning these error objects, we need to stop evaluation. 
we do this in our eval program method and our evaluate statement block method. It's really easy like. You just check to see if we have an error evaluation result and return if we do. Although it does mean switching up our code just a little bit. And the evaluate statement block method is going to be something similar. We just kick back our unwrapped object as usual. The last thing that we need to do is go to our top level eval function and make sure that we are not just passing around an error object and then logging it far away from where it should be handled. In each one of our switch cases, let's call a helper method is error before handling the next step of our evaluation. Do this for each case that calls eval and then passes the result into another helper method. The is error helper method is very simple. It takes an object and returns an object. The object passed in is not null. We return true if the object is of the error object type. Otherwise, we return false. And that, my friends, is how you handle errors. Next thing that we're going to do is something that will take our language to the next level, and that is to add bindings. We need to be able to use the let statement to bind a value or a function to a variable, and we need to be able to access that variable on command within its scope. The first thing that we need to do to begin support for evaluating bindings is add a case to our eval for let statements. And this is pretty standard. The rub comes after we have actually evaluated the value on the right hand side. How do we bind it to a name? We could use a global hash map inside of this evaluator, but that would linger even when the scope of the variable has been closed. Therefore, we want to create the concept of a scope or an environment. And I'll be honest, all it is going to be is a wrapper around a map. So go ahead and create an environment struct inside of our object package. It is going to have a variable called store that maps a string to an object. Next, create a constructor for it that will initialize the store. Then create two helper methods, get and set, to get and set the values for the environment. Now the trick is, how do we add this to what we already have? Well, my friends, first you want to include it as a parameter to the top level eval function. And if you notice, this breaks a whole lot of stuff. I won't show all the changes, but just update all of the method headers that are broken and pass in an environment parameter. And for the environment parameter that you are actually going to pass in, just use the one that we are passing in at the top level eval function. Also remember to update our console package so that it will create a new environment and pass it into the eval function. And now that we have that in place, just update the switch case for the let statement. After we get the value after a call to evaluate, just store it in our env with a call to set. And that takes care of our let statements. But now we need to add a switch case for when we come across an identifier node that we need to evaluate. So add another case for our identifiers. In the body of the case, just return the result of a call to the helper function eval identifier, passing in the node in the environment. And this helper method is very simple. All we are going to do is grab the identifier from the environment. If we can't find it, we will return an error. Otherwise, we return the associated object. And with this in place, we can use let statements. Make sure to check this out in the console to make sure that it works. And it starts to really feel like we have a language coming together here. And now it is time for the piece de resistance, the white whale, the big kahuna function calls. In order to get from the sad little place that we currently live to the land of paradise and higher order functions, we need a couple of things. First, we need to design a function class in our object system and a way to actually evaluate a function call. The object for a function will look pretty similar to the parse tree object we created previously. In the object package, add an object type for function, and in the struct, store a list of parameters, a statement block for the body, and then keep a reference to an environment. Next, override the two object methods. The inspect method will be a little long, but it looks something like this. Next, go back to your evaluator package and add a case to our eval function for function literals. For the body, all we are doing is grabbing the parameters and body from our node and creating a new function object with those values. And take note that for the moment, we are just going to keep using the current environment for our function. And this takes care of actually evaluating the body of a function, but now we need to be able to evaluate the function calls themselves. And as per usual, Add a switch case to our eval function for the call expression nodes. All we are doing at the moment is calling that nifty evaluation method that we just wrote to retrieve the function. 
But now, how do we actually evaluate? First things first, we have to resolve all of the argument expressions inside of our call expression node down to their values. This just boils down to calling eval on each one and keeping track of the results in a list. And we are going to do this through a helper method called evaluate expressions. This method takes an array of expressions, an environment, and returns an array of objects. Create the result object array, then, then loop over each one of the expressions. Evaluate each expression, check if there's an error, and append it to the result. Call this inside of the case body of the switch statement for call expressions. And once we have the result, we do a quick check to make sure that we have no errors in our arguments. All that is left to do is to extend our current environment so that our function can run free and we won't have to worry about it overriding our current environment. To do this, add a new variable to our environment object called outer that represents the environment that this environment is nested snugly inside of. Now create a function called new enclosed environment. This takes an existing environment as a parameter, and we will call our new environment constructor and then populate the outer field with the environment that was passed in. Next up is to spruce up our get method. We want to be able to retrieve variables from the outer layers as well, so we need to update our get to continuously check our outer environment until we either find the variable or we hit environment bedrock. We just do this with a nifty for loop. Now go back to the evaluator package and as the last step of the body of our call expression case, we're going to return the result of an apply function method. The apply function method will accept the function and the arguments that we just evaluated. Inside of this function, create a function variable and assign it to the function passed in and do a quick check on the result. Next, create our new nested environment with a call to extended function environment, passing in the function and the argument. Let's go ahead and create this method. First thing to do is create a new child environment as a sandbox. Then, for each parameter that gets passed into our function, call set in our environment using the parameter name and corresponding argument. Then, return the environment. After this, we call eval on the function body and the new environment we just created. And lastly, return the result from a helper method called unwrap return value with the evaluated result. This helper method is very simple and should be easy to follow. All it does is unpack the result of the method by casting the evaluated result to a return object and then returns the value. And with that, JDs and Lentleman, we can now use functions in our little language. So go ahead and give it a test drive. Bask in the satisfaction of creating a programming language. And that is going to do it for the current video. In the next one, we're going to create some data types and really polish up our language before we call it quits. See you there.